All right, thank you, worship team, for leading us in song today as we worship through singing. And uh, we've, uh, again, we're excited you're with us this morning, even if it's through online or through our live stream this morning or DVD or recording, however it is you're watching, we want to say thank you for joining us today. Over the past few weeks, we have been looking at one verse of Scripture in the Bible for this Christmas season. And it, one of the things I was thinking this morning is how much I love the Bible. It, it's so rich, so powerful, and that we can take one verse, and we can take that one verse and take weeks to study and, and uh, kind of dig a little deeper, if you will, into that verse and into God's Word. And that's what we've been doing. In the Old Testament, there's a book of the Bible named Isaiah. And in chapter 9, verse 6, it is a really popular verse that many people read from and talk about during the Christmas season. And we have been taking a few weeks to look at that verse and the different names or the different titles that are given to Jesus. Now, uh, the first week we looked at it, and it was the name or the title, Wonderful Counselor. Last week, we looked at the title, Mighty God, Mighty God. And if you remember last week, if you were uh, able to watch, I had my son, my oldest son, come up on stage with me. And if, if you didn't get to watch it, uh, you can go back on our Facebook page or YouTube page and you can see that service. Uh, but I had my son, oldest son come on stage with me and we talked, had a little conversation about, uh, about different heroes. I listed off some heroes, and then he came, came up and talked about uh, some of the ancient heroes, and he gave us an example of a hero that the ancient Greeks would look to for the hero of strength. And I remember as I was having a conversation with Timothy, last week as he's sharing with you about some of the, uh, some of the ways that they believed in this ancient hero. Uh, I remember thinking, I, I'm proud of my son. I'm thankful for the intelligence that God has given him. But uh, I also remember thinking, I love being a dad. Being a dad is just so much fun. Having my son up here, uh, it was the first time he had come on stage with me as I preached. And it was a wonderful experience, and I just remember thinking, I love being a dad. And when I go home at the end of the day from work, and I'm able to play with my kids and make sure that they go to bed peacefully and quietly, well, I don't know if that happens. But uh, I'm at least, I try my best to be home when they go to bed. But even when I go home and I, and I try to play with the kids, there are times that um, I realize I'm not the perfect dad I really realize that daily in, in our household. I'm not the perfect dad. Uh, I'll get down and I'll try to play with my kids. And the next thing I know, I fell asleep. I was trying to be engaged and I fall asleep playing with my kids. And my wife, uh, my loving wife, she recognized this. And one Father's Day, uh, it was a gift from my kids. But she gave me a t-shirt is a blank t-shirt, but on the back, she drew uh, this city on the back of this t-shirt and little roads and buildings. And when I fall asleep playing with my kids, the kids will then take a little car and they'll, if I'm wearing that shirt, and they'll just ride that little car on that shirt that I'm wearing. And, but, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, that I realize, goodness, I'm not the perfect father uh, I fell in so many ways, but, uh, but I'm thankful for God and His faithfulness in our family. Uh, but there are other families. If I were to mention some of these names, there are fathers that maybe you recognize. And when I mention these names, maybe you are familiar with some of them. Uh, if I were to mention the name Danny Tanner, Danny Tanner, some of you may recognize that name from the television show Full House. What about Andy Taylor? Some of you might be familiar with that name. He, he was the father on the Andy Griffith show. What about Frank Costanza? He was the father on Seinfeld. What about Jason 
deceiver. Look, I could go on and list names of fathers that maybe you are familiar with from television. And I read through a list of names that were uh, famous fathers on television. One article even titled the article, Dads That Practically Raised Us. And they listed off a list of names of fathers from sitcoms and TV shows uh, of fathers that the article said practically raised us. We watched them week after week and, and we listened to the wisdom that they shared with, the, with those that were on the same TV show with them. And the article said these are dads that practically raised us. But there are fathers on television that are portrayed on television that we see uh, as the shows portray them, that they are portrayed differently. There are some fathers on TV that are portrayed as smart. So these are smart fathers. They're wise. And the children on the TV show, they listen to them. Those that they work with, they listen to their wisdom and counsel. But then there are other fathers that are portrayed on television that maybe aren't as smart, and instead of them giving wisdom, they are, they are receiving wisdom from their children or from someone else. There are other fathers that are the ones in the show or the movies that are doing the saving, right? I think of you know, to show my age here, Harrison Ford. And Harrison Ford would run in and save the day, right? But then there are other dads on TV, shows or movies, that they need to be saved. Or the kids come in and they do the saving. There are fathers who are portrayed as leaders in the home and in the community and in their workplace. But then there are other fathers who are portrayed as one who needs to be led. And sometimes it's the children or someone else that comes in and leads the father. As we're talking about the subject this morning of fathers, uh, would you join me this morning in turning to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We're going to continue in this one Bible verse this Christmas season and look at the next title that will be given to this child or to this son. So will you honor the reading of God's Word this morning as we read from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And you can honor God's Word by reading along with me or by following along. Isaiah 9, 6. The prophet writes, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Let's stop right there. Will you bow your head with me this morning as we pray and ask God to help us as we tackle this, this title, Everlasting Father, and as we can ask God this morning to teach us and lead us in how we should respond to this sermon today. Will you pray with me? God, as we come before you today, God, we are going to look at a title, a name that was given to this son or to this child that on the surface, God, it's a title that we may oftentimes just breathe past and, and just kind of breeze through. But God, I pray as we stop and as we examine this title of Everlasting Father, God, help us to see the miracle in this title. Help us to see the mystery in this title. And God, help us today to respond to this title that you have given, this son, this child that is to be born. God, I pray today that as we work through this, God, that even though we may not understand all that took place in the birth of your son, son Jesus, God, God, I pray that you will help us to be able to believe, place our trust in it, to marvel at it, to wonder at the, at the manger and at this birth of this child that we're going to talk about today. If there's someone that's watching today that's not a Christian, God, I pray that you will help them today. Open their eyes. God, help them see the mystery and the miracle and the wonder of the birth child. And God, who are Christians, God, I pray, pray that you will help them today to look to Jesus, to look to your Son, no matter the problem or the situation they're facing, God, 
You care for them, you protect them, you nourish them, you love them. Help them today to look to the Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. All right, now, we've looked at Wonderful Counselor, we've looked at Mighty God this week. I want us to take some time and to look at this title, Everlasting Father. But before we look at why we need an Everlasting Father, this morning I want us to look at what the words Everlasting and Father mean. So let's first start with the word Everlasting. Now, it may seem kind of simple, but the word everlasting means eternal, or it means eternity. So what this means is the everlasting or the eternal or the eternity means that there's no beginning. There's no beginning. And it's hard for us to understand because we have beginnings, right? But for the eternal Father or the everlasting Father, there's no beginning. And then at the same time, there's no ending to this everlasting Father or this eternal Father. And the Bible teaches this. Throughout the pages of the Bible, it teaches that God is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Exodus chapter 15 verse 18 says, The Lord reigns forever and ever. So everlasting means eternal. But then you get to the word Father. Father's a little bit more difficult for us to kind of sum up into one word or even to sum up in, a, in like a sentence for a definition. Because the word father has a wide variety of meaning, even in the Hebrew language that the prophet Isaiah was writing in. So the word father means ancestor. The word father also means founder. The word father also means author or maker. The word father in the Hebrew also means nourisher. It also means master. It means teacher. So we see in this passage that the word father has just this wide variety of meaning to it. And I also think the same is true as I've been talking about the word Father today. I started off the sermon talking about Father. I'm going to continue throughout this message talking about Father. And as I mention Father, for some of you today, when you hear the word Father, maybe it brings back uh, feelings of joy in your life. When you hear Father or Dad, uh, maybe that brings back uh, times from your childhood. Uh, you know, your father would pile you and, you and your siblings up in the station wagon and you would just drive, drive off and go camping. Or you would take family trips and you remember these wonderful feelings and wonderful memories with your father. And some of you may even, maybe even recognize today that you are blessed with a wonderful father. But for some of you, as I mentioned father this morning, maybe when I mentioned that word father or dad, maybe there's not very many good feelings or thoughts or memories that you have about your dad. Maybe for you there's history of abuse or neglect or even there's maybe even an absence of a father for some of you. So we see in Isaiah 9, 6, in the Hebrew, there's a wide and a broad variety here of meaning for the word Father. But I know for some of you watching today, and for those of you who are listening today, there's a wide variety of feeling and thoughts and, and, and memories with the word Father. But as we've examined this passage, this one verse throughout the month of December so far, what we've learned about this child that will be born, what we've learned about this son that is given to us is first this child is wonderful counselor. The word wonderful means it's someone that we can marvel at. Counsel is the wisdom and the truth that this child brings is something that we can marvel at. And then we talked last week about mighty God. This is a child that is powerful. This is a child that is God in the flesh. 
So what we've seen up to this point with this child that is being born is that there is there has never been a child that has been born quite like this child, nor will there ever be a child that is like this child. So today, as we proceed, as we move forward in talking about this eternal father this morning, I want you to know right here from the start, right here from the very beginning, that there is no one like this father that we're talking about. So even if you have wonderful experiences or negative feelings or negative thoughts about your earthly father, there is no one like the father that we're talking about today in this passage. So we need to ask ourselves the question now, why do we need an everlasting father? I think in order to answer that question, we need to go back to why Isaiah is writing this verse. We need to look at the context, if you will. So let's go back to Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah begins this prophetic book by giving a list of names and giving some of his history in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1. But in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2, Isaiah begins to write what God is saying to his people. And I want to read to you this verse, Isaiah 1 verse 2. And I want you to hear what God is saying to his people. In Isaiah 1 2, Isaiah writes, The Lord has spoken. All right? This is very important. If God speaks, we better listen. Right? So, the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up. Now, what does God call his people? What has the Lord called his people according to this passage? Children. God calls his people children. God is saying in this verse, in just the very few first words of Isaiah, he's saying here that God has raised his children. God has brought his children up. God has taught his children. God has provided for his children. God has nourished his children. God has protected his children. God is truly their father. So we see that right off the bat here in Isaiah chapter 1. But God didn't stop with saying, children have I reared and brought up. But God continued. In Isaiah 1, 2, God continued by saying, but they have rebelled against me. What God is saying in this passage is his people or his children have rebelled against me their father. Now, the word rebel in this passage means to revolt. God's people have revolted. They have rebelled. They want to separate from their heavenly father. So because of this revolt from their heavenly father, because of this rebellion against God, uh, God said in Isaiah 128, but rebels and sinners shall be broken together. What God is saying is because of your rebellion, because of this revolt, destruction is coming. Brokenness is coming because of your separation against me. They needed a heavenly father. They needed a father to lead them, to guide them, to nourish them, and to protect them. But they had fathers that they could have looked to, right? I mean, if you think about the history of the children of God, they could have looked all the way back to Abraham. God had told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, in the very opening words to Abraham, God had promised that Abraham would be the father of all the families of the earth. So they could have looked to Abraham, but the issue with Abraham was Abraham wasn't perfect. Okay, what about someone from Abraham's family lineage? What about Lot? That's Abraham's nephew. 
Lot was not the perfect father, okay? So they couldn't have looked to Lot. What about Abraham's son, Isaac? Well, they couldn't look to Isaac to be their perfect righteous father because Isaac wasn't perfect. Isaac showed favoritism to his children. What about Noah? Noah, this is a great example of a father who wanted to be a leader and a protector of his children. Noah built the ark, right? Noah brought his family into the ark. Noah protected his family. He provided safety for his family. Noah provided and nourished his family. But when the ark landed after this global flood had receded, Noah, we see, is not the perfect father. So what we see here from Isaiah 9, 6 is their greatest need in their life would not come from someone on this earth. Their greatest need had to come from an everlasting father. And today, we need an everlasting father. Today, we need an eternal father. Father, for many of you watching today, you may be thinking within your heart, within your mind, that you are living in rebellion against God. For some of you, you recognize that you are living in a revolt against God, against your heavenly Father. And today, when you think about the sin in your life, the sin that you're not confessing, the sin that you're not repenting of, that is a complete revolt against your heavenly Father. And sin leads to destruction. Sin leads to brokenness in our lives. And here in Isaiah 9, verse 6, Isaiah is pointing God's children. He's pointing us to someone that will be called everlasting Father in His name, Jesus. Today I want to read from the Christmas story. We open up the, the service this morning with this passage, and I want to continue this morning by reading about the birth or the, the announcement of the birth of Jesus to Mary. In Luke 1, starting in verse 26, the angel appeared to Mary, and the angel said to her, greetings or rejoice, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and she tried to discern what sort of greeting this would be. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. You know, as we read the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, we are not just reading about a birth of another child in the history of the world, but we are reading about the God of history who is wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. This is His story that we're reading about. This is the greatest miracle in the world in history that we are reading about when we read about the birth of Jesus. But it's also the greatest mystery in the history of the world. In, in Isaiah 9, 6, this is the mystery that we see. Last Sunday, we learned that God came in the flesh as we talked about Jesus is God. But I don't want us to misunderstand what Isaiah is saying here. And as we talk about Jesus being God, I also don't want us to misunderstand that Jesus is God, but Jesus is not the Father, okay? You see, the Bible teaches there is one God, but there's also one Father, one Son, and one Holy Spirit. But there's only one God. This is what we call a mystery. It's a mystery. 
So then what are we talking about here when Isaiah is writing about an everlasting father? And what is taking place when Jesus is born? Well, I think let's go to the source himself. When Jesus started his ministry and called his disciples together and he lived perfectly on this earth, there came a point where Jesus started to teach his disciples that he must die and that he must be buried, that he will come back to life again, but that he would ascend, that he would go back to the Father in heaven. And in John chapter 13, as Jesus is teaching this to his disciples, the disciples became afraid. They had just heard that Jesus, Jesus told them he's going to be leaving, so the disciples became afraid. And in John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, Jesus said, believe also in me. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you or bring you back to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Well, Thomas, again, a little bit confused here, said, Jesus, how do we know the way that you are going? Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. He said, no one goes to the Father except through him. And then Philip asks another question to Jesus. As Jesus is teaching, Philip then asks this question in John 14, 8. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. I want you to hear Jesus' response. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus said, the words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. And in John 14, Verse 11, Jesus said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. What Jesus is teaching his disciples and what he is teaching us today as he's talking about he is in the Father and the Father is in him is that there is union with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There is a oneness with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is a union, there's a unity with their power. There is a oneness with their care. There is a oneness with their provision. There is a oneness with their nourishment. There is a oneness with their purpose. And today, if you truly want to know God, look to Jesus. When Jesus was teaching his disciples, about the Father being in him, and about he being in the Father. Jesus didn't tell Philip, understand this. Jesus simply told Philip, believe me. And today, if you want to see the Father, if you want to have this relationship with our heavenly Father that I've been talking about today, then you must look to the baby in the manger. You must look to the one that lived a perfect sinless life. You must rest your hope and your trust on the one who died on the cross and came back to life again. How do we know today that Jesus is our everlasting Father? Look to Jesus to see the love, to see the joy, to see the peace of our Father. And today as we've been talking about this our Heavenly Father, our Eternal Father today, I want to ask you today, have you been living in rebellion? Have you been living in a revolt against God? Today I want to warn you that this revolt that you're living against God, this rebellion against God, leads to destruction. It leads to brokenness in your life. And today I want to tell you that God has sent a rescue. And his name is Jesus. 
Our Heavenly Father provided the way for us. And again, His name is Jesus. And the Bible teaches today when, when we place our faith, our trust, our hope in what Jesus did, and when we admit to God that we are a sinner, and when we tell God through prayer that we believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he came back to life again, and through prayer we tell God and we confess that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord, the Bible says we will be saved. And what about today for you who are Christians? Today I want to ask you, how have you been living this Christmas season trying to please the Father? Have you been trying to do enough good things, hoping that the good will outweigh the bad in your Christian life? Have you been trying to just give enough good gifts and hoping that that will outweigh the bad in your life and not even looking to Jesus? Today I want to encourage you, Christian, today. Today I want to encourage you to look to Jesus. Jesus cares for you. Jesus nourishes your soul. Jesus is the author and the perfecter, or he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is our protector. He's our nourisher today. What are you facing in your life, Christian? Are you facing worry? Are you facing anxiety? Are you facing fear? Today, I want to encourage you today, look to Jesus. He is our wonderful counselor. He is our mighty God, and he is our everlasting Father. Will you bow your head with me today as we